Welcome, everyone. I'm Bash. This is the Pub Crawlers, and we are hosting an IRS charity workshop walkthrough. Joining me today is Kiss Supply. Hello, Kiss. Howdy, I'm Kiss. And so we're on section two out of a whole bunch from the small to mid sized tax exempt organization workshop. And if you look at the main right page here, we already did this first applying for section 501c3 status last time. Today, we're going to be doing maintaining 501c3 status. Let's begin. So, welcome to the Maintaining 501c3 Tax Exempt Status course. So welcome exciting. Welcome to the Maintaining 501c3 Tax Exempt Status course. Oh, this course is presented the, by the Exempt Organizations the Office of the IRS. Ah, yeah. Hi, I'm Legal, the Stay Exempt Eagle. And I'll <laughs> Legal, the Stay Exempt here. Eagle. <laughs> This course includes questions and activities to test your knowledge. You'll need to click on the screen to answer the questions and participate in the activities. When you're Before ready we to begin, about tax exempt status, select the objectives button. Are we ready, everyone? Not quite. You gotta change over the stream to the IRS page. Is it? Still got your notes. Oh, for you. You're talking about for you, yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's just that's just that's just a you problem, man. Like, <laughs> I, f I feel like you need to uh, fix that. Look, look, see, look, look. I'm oh, oh, see. Yeah. Look, yeah. look. Oh, I, I just had to complain about it a little bit. <laughs> look away. <laughs> like I said, totally you. <laughs> all right, sorry about that, man. Anyways, now we're all ready to go. After how many hiccups we can come up with, um. We ready, Mr. Stay Exempt Eagle? We're ready to stay ready. exempt. In this course, Objectives. we'll talk about running an organization properly once 501c3 tax exempt status is achieved. To do that, you'll need to know what responsibilities you have and what activities can jeopardize your organization's 501c3 status. You'll also find it helpful to familiarize yourself with the charitable solicitation rules of your state and learn a bit about good governance practices. First, let's meet someone who just got their tax exempt status. Select the Meet Richard button to continue. I'm just going to throw. Yeah, it. Richard. Oh, man. I'm so stoked for his zoo. Then that's. I'm just going to write these down because this is like the overview thing we're going to be doing here. So, learn about state yeah, charitable solicitation. Solicitation. And then describe good governance practices. Mm hmm. All right. Ready when you are. One second. No worries. Maintain. 501c3. Tax exempt status. All right, I'm good. All right, so objectives are appropriate operations. Responsibilities, jeopardizing activities, charitable solicitation, and good government practices. Seems pretty straightforward. Hi, I'm Richard. I just received my determination letter from the IRS. It says my animal rescue organization, Cute and Curly Animal Rescue, has been recognized under Section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code as exempt from federal income tax. I've always loved taking care of animals, so managing this animal rescue correctly is really important to me. Starting my organization and applying for tax-exempt status were big steps. Yes. And I want to make sure I do uh -huh. everything I can to comply with the law. What's wrong with his teeth? Legal can you offer me any advice? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Sure I can, sorry. Richard. Maintaining your you federal tax out. exempt status isn't difficult, but it sure helps if you're aware of your organization's required interactions with the IRS. Here's the five-stage life cycle oh, of public this one again. tool the IRS uses to illustrate those interactions so I I remember when that. they occur. Right. You've already completed the first two stages of the process, starting out and applying for exemption. As you may remember during our Applying for 501c3 Status Overview course, here's a link if you'd like to review. Iris. Now, you have general responsibilities described in the three remaining stages, required filings, ongoing compliance, and significant events. Click on each stage in the process to find out more about it. Although We've, these topics mm -hmm. were briefly covered in the Applying for Section 501c3 Status Overview course, 
These three stages are most important to the daily operations of your organization. We'll cover them in more detail now. Yes. Let's start out with Required Filings. Select the Required Filings button to continue. All right, just going to make a little note here for our first thing. The next one's going to be ongoing compliance and then significant events. Wow, I really can't type, man. My 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 fingers are like dead, <laughs> just dead to the like brain. <laughs> my fingers will type what they want. Yes. All right. And so moving on to required filling filings. Fillings, man. Come on, rain. <laughs> so, what should I focus on first? Well, Richard, it's a good idea to take a look at the IRS's life cycle tool. Here's a link. A very important stage of the life cycle. They just keep linking back to the same shit on each help slide. You just what to file with the IRS. But before you learn what forms to use and when to file them, let's talk about something that will help you prepare, and that's record keeping. Record keeping. If you don't keep accurate and detailed records of your organization's activities, you won't have the information you need to complete the filing requirements. But I'm still not sure what records I really need to keep. I think my friend Vernon can help you with that. He's the treasurer <laughs> of the Highland Middle School wow. organization. Hi, Richard. I can help you with that. I've managed a lot of records for our organization, which is classified as a public charity, just like yours. Your organization is going to have all kinds of financial records. You need to keep any accounting information you have, whether you do it using paper files like I do, or fancy computer software. Or fancy computer software. <laughs> okay, a little sass there. Permanent record, which includes your organizing document, which is sometimes called your articles of incorporation or your charter, a copy of your Form 1023, the exemption application you submitted, and the determination letter from the IRS you just mentioned. Have you filed any returns with the IRS yet? No, not yet. Be sure to keep copies of any returns and attachments you send to the IRS. Why? And keep the records. Why did, why did they just prepare the returns handy? The son of a bitches. This includes your financial records and other things, like information about your organization's programs, meeting minutes for the governing board, and minutes Ooh. for any standing committee. Which we have a bunch of. Like an executive or compensation committee. All right, so I want to write those down real quick because it got rid of the ones earlier, and I want to make sure I note those again um, real fast. And I'm yeah, sure... meeting minutes, that's, that's, that's handy. Yep, we've been doing that since 2017, I think, was our first one. Richard better get his stuff filed quick. I don't know how how much longer Vernon's gonna hang on. Hmm. You're so mean. <laughs> Look at him. He's way too happy about this. <laughs> <laughs> that little like curled up her lip thing, like that, uh, adorable. All right, I'm gonna play it again. The IRS suggests keeping copies of returns and any supporting information for at least three years after you file the return. Next. Let's talk more about the financial records you need to keep. Select the financial records button to move on. I'm going to refresh this one real fast just because slide six here. Uh, I do want to. Move. Or not move, but I, I want to uh, see this again where it says per permit records. There was a piece underneath that. That it went through a little bit weird. And this is nice. Now, can I, okay, so it's going through fast, apparently? Oh, okay, all right, now I get it. There's a fast forward button. I'm finally understanding how to use this goddamn. <laughs> All right, so for permanent records, we're just going to make sure these are in here. The organizing document, like your articles of association, is what we would be doing for ours, for instance. Organizing. This needs to prepare. It's still prepared, right? Form 10. That's the application. Um, 
I wonder why 990 is not in there, though. Determination letter. Of course, you got to have your determination letter. Yeah. I guess what they are, the annual filings is where the 990 would fall under. So I, I see why they did them separate. Anyways. Have you filed any returns we forward. with the IRS yet? No, not yet. Be sure to keep copies. Of there. The that's what it's talking. Okay. See? Ha ha. I was uh, right. And keep the records you use to prepare the returns handy, too. This includes your financial records and other things, like information about your organization's programs, meeting minutes for the governing board, and minutes for any standing committees, like mm -hmm. an executive mm -hmm. or compensation committee. The IRS suggests keeping copies of returns and any supporting information for at least three years after you file the return. Next, let's Next. talk more about the financial records you need to keep. Select the financial records button to move on. Right, finance. Financial records. So Yay. what kind of financial records do I need to keep? There are four basic types of financial records you should keep. Four can basic be categorized types. categorized as money coming in, money going out, employment tax records, and asset records. Let's discuss each type of record. Well, so, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm just going to employ... Yeah, slow down, Vernon. <laughs> I'm rewriting your shit. You, you better speak slower. You know what would be nice? If, like, that's how, like, school worked. Like, you could just pause your teacher while you were writing notes real fast. <laughs> that would have been handy in so many cases. You know, now I kind of want all schools to be, like, pre-recorded. But then you couldn't ask questions. Ah. Oh. But okay, here, I got this. That's what they have office hours for. Yeah, that's, that's what TAs are for. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Underpaid interns. Hit the money coming in <laughs> button to learn more. All right, so money coming in. First, I recommend that you keep records of all the money that comes into your organization. This includes cash register receipts, bank deposit slips, receipt books, invoices, credit card slips, well, I mean, I don't really need to describe what that is. That is documents you send to the IRS. That's pretty obvious what that is. Records for three years right. after the date the return is due or filed, whichever is later, because during that time you can amend a return to claim a credit or refund. Generally, this is also the period when the IRS can assess penalties or additional tax. That's crazy that it's only three years for a nonprofit, but for a person, it's seven. Parties, <laughs> yeah. Such as grantor, insurance company, creditor, or state agency may require you to keep certain records for a longer time. Yeah, that that is true because each state is different on how long they take. Next, some some states actually require a lot longer out. than three. Select the money going out button to learn more. All right, so we get on this for what money coming in means. Yeah. Sweet. You should save any documents that show expenses you incurred while running your organization and its programs, including account statements, canceled checks, cash register receipts, credit card sales slips, invoices, and petty cash slips. If your organization produces and sells items, save documents on the materials you purchase to produce those items. These records will also help you determine the value of your inventory at the end of the year. As I mentioned earlier, you should save these documents for three years after the date the return is due or filed, whichever is later. For more information, see Publication 538, Accounting Periods and Methods. Ooh, Next, I want to save that. About employment tax records. Select the Employment Tax <gasps> Records button to continue. Oh, yeah, look at that one. This looks so much fun. <laughs> all right, that's, Glory. all right, yeah, sweet. That's actually really cool. I'm glad. I've, I've been looking for basically this. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so for money coming in, money coming out, those are pretty straightforward concepts. Uh, I don't really think we need too much details on the notes on that. Um, no. It, yeah, like you said, it seems pretty obvious. Employment tax records. This might be a you little bit more. save all employment tax records, including any documents that show salaries, mm -hmm. wages, benefits paid, and taxes withheld. You may think employment tax records sound like money going out, but these documents are really a separate category. Yeah, that makes sense. Employment records should be kept for at least because it's technically an expense. There are other employment related items, but it's technically attention. money for going those, out. Take a look at publication 15. But it's an internal expense. Employer's tax guide. Yeah. For more all right. Information. Finally, let's talk Boys about the asset years. records. Select the asset records button to learn more. There's two H's in withheld. 
I'm an ass. I'm, I'm dumbass. Damn. <laughs> oh, interesting. So you should keep these for at least four years. A lot of this stuff, in my opinion, we need at least like a five year record on it. But I, I think it uh, actually comes down to uh, states once again. Yeah, I think personally, I I would definitely want to hold them longer. Yeah, what we would do is in our articles of associations or, um, you know, however we want to um, organize that, we would say that, you know, even though RS says three years, we require five or something like that. Asset records are documents showing the items your organization owns and uses in its activities, such as investments, buildings, and furniture. Select this asset records link to find I mean, out that, more about... Okay, so that's physical and non... That are tangible and non-tangible. Documents include yeah. purchase and sales invoices, real estate closing statements, canceled checks, or certain financial account statements, as well as financial documents. Finally, you should keep these documents for as long as you own the asset, plus three years after you dispose of them. Hmm. Now that you understand the types of financial records you need to keep, let's try an activity. Select the knowledge check button to try it out. Intangible. There we go. So that would in, that would include investments as well too, and it, like yeah, like like non uh, non tangible investments. So um, uh, say we like invest in some fucking stock or some shit. But again, not something we're doing. Just just good to know. Oh, crawlers NFT. Fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> EFT. Then select the submit button to check your answer. All right. Let's try an exercise. Richard is still unsure of what documents fall into each category. There are four record categories that the RS suggests you retain. Money coming in, money going out, employment, tax records, and asset records. Put the four items below in that order. Dude. Oh, it's broken. Dude. Come on. Come on, Legal <laughs> Eagle. Come on. How? How is this one so much worse than the one that we did before? The first one was perfect, flawless. All right, no so we, we're on slide 12. Let's just go look at this thing real quick. Okay, so it's supposed to be... Uh, da, 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 where? Oh, here, those are the correct answers. Here, which category? Okay, pile of canceled okay. checks. For office. Richard has a pile of canceled checks for office supplies. Which category should this fall under? Asset record. Cancelled checks. Wouldn't that still be money going out? Or asset records? Uh, oh, correct answer is money going out and a win! <laughs> yeah, I was going to say asset records, but... No, because it, it, it did say in uh, the previous slide that even, like, any money going out, even if it isn't out, if it's supposed to go out, if it, uh, if it was money that would be going out, even if it's canceled or whatnot, it would still be under that uh, category. See, okay. Um, the asset records is much more of like things that you already have, you know, that aren't an expense. It's an, yeah, like that's it, not really an asset. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, so, and then next, he's not sure about a credit card receipt for a new desk. Which should this be? Money coming in, money going out. Employment tax record, asset record, trash can. So wait, he has the new desk. They said furniture for uh, uh, words. You got this. What are they? <laughs> asset records, that's it. Yep, absolutely. Because the fact, like, even though it's the credit card receipt, which would be like an expense item that you're going to want to look at as an expense, it's for the new desk, which is a the tangible thing that's an actual asset that the thing that the, the the entity owns yeah so totally totally makes sense all right a volunteer just dropped off a bank deposit slip deposit i heard that <laughs> which category does it fall under <laughs> so a deposit would be money coming in there's no question yeah. about that um correct answer money coming in um someone left out the packaging box for that new desk where does this belong Money coming in, trash money coming in. Trash can. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, and it, I like how it's, it corrects it, trash can or recycle bin. Yes, but no, that, Aww. yeah. So someone, like the, the packaging for the new, yeah, that's. Environmentally friendly. Depends on what your uh, your nonprofit is, honestly. It really does. Really does. All right. 
So then, finally, Richard needs a, to file a new... Wow. Wow. My brain just, like, turned all those words into different words. Anyways, <laughs> finally, Richard needs to file a few salary documents. Which would this be? Trash can. I'm going to assume just off the way that like multiple choice works, it's probably the one that we haven't selected yet, which would be employment tax records. But that is what, in my opinion, should be the answer because it's a salary document that's employment. Exactly. Makes sense to me. And yay, they didn't yeah. bold. Why didn't they bold this one? Why are they so inconsistent? Who the fuck works at the IRS? No, I'm, just kidding. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Cheers, IRS. I love you. Um, anyways. Sorry, legal Eagle. So we can't really do this because screw all those. Um, fuck. So what <laughs> we got them right, I swear. Require a specific record keeping system, so you can choose one that makes sense for your organization. Mm -mm 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 -mm. But remember, mm -mm. record if your keeping system has mm -mm. more than one program. Your record keeping system should allow you to track the income and expenses for each program separately. Also, your record should include sense. a summary of transactions. This summary can be listed in your books, including journals and ledgers, or many small organizations use checkbooks as the main source for entries into the books, and that's fine too. Gross. That makes sense. Next, I hate checkbooks. Learn about the <laughs> and methods your organization should use in its reporting. Select the accounting period and methods button to continue. Um, like if I can't export it to like a CV file or some shit or some like some kind of fucking Excel file, like. Fuck, dude. If I have to hand enter all that shit, no. Ew. <laughs> all right. So any, I just want to make sure that this is pretty pretty much makes sense, but I just wanted to maybe put this in the notes here under record, keeping record system. Mm. All right, okay. Uh, how can I, uh, I'm just, so basically what I want to make sure that is like, this all makes sense. Anything that you're doing needs to be tracked separately as its own like thing, as its own program, but then summarized together too. I get that. I don't know how to put that in the notes. Oh. Uh, you know what? Here. Here. What you do, screenshot it? No, I'm, I'm just going to uh, put a little note under financial records per program and overall. So, Richard, it's important for you to know if your organization will report to the IRS using a calendar year or a fiscal year. And does your organization use a cash or accrual accounting method or some sort of combination of the two? Every organization must use a consistent accounting method, which is a set of rules for determining when to report income and expenses. Under the cash method, generally, you report income in the tax year you received it, and you deduct expenses in the tax year you paid them. Most likely what we'll be doing. Generally, under an accrual method, you report income in the tax year you earn it, regardless of when payment is received. You deduct expenses in the tax year you incur them, regardless of when payment is made. My organization, for example, uses the cash method and the calendar year as its reporting or tax year. An organization typically makes these decisions when it begins operating and before it files its first annual tax return. When you applied for exemption, you used your application to tell the IRS what tax year and what accounting method you plan to use. Make sure you know what your organization told the IRS so you report the right items at the right time using the right method. Now that we know about the records you should keep and a little bit about how you'll report and for what period, let's talk about what you have to send the IRS. Select the Form 990 Options button to move ahead. Sweet. Okay, I'm going to write these down here real quick because I think this yeah. is pretty straightforward, but also something we need to remember and make decisions on, which is most likely going to be annual, most likely going to be cash. But still something that we'll have to like discuss uh, and make decision on and put in the... Articles of Association. All right, so annual. So 
So gross income of all items of income you actually or constructively. What? Yeah, the constructively part caught me too. Is that so? so is that referring to I like think that first five years that your no, org is open? No, I think that's just some legalese about whether or not you're getting um like if someone's giving you money, if you're getting um, a loan, if you're getting like like um, if it's not necessarily actual uh received, you know, like yeah. uh, like like if you get a loan for something that's technically income, but it's not money that you necessarily received as income. I get it. Um, and I think there's also some stipulations between like certain kinds of donations and whether or not if it's like from other individuals or other things. So uh, I think that's just like legal termination between those two. We could look that up there real fast if you wanted to. I'm writing this up. Yeah, why not? No, not defined. Just received during the tax year. Oh. What you got? So in terms of income, when there is constructive receipt of income, this means that taxpayers cannot pay their taxes on income or compensation that has not been spent yet. So it's like a promissory note? In, From the sounds of it. That's weird. So it's like, hey, I'm going to give you $1,000, but I haven't given it to you yet. That person can't be taxed on it yet until they get it. Right. But then, okay. Hmm. I don't think we would be necessarily sit, it, dealing with anything of that nature because any of our donations are going to be direct and I, we're not going to be looking for any kind of systems where people are going to be paying us promissory money in the future <laughs> necessarily that is something to keep an eye on though yeah uh there is two publications there's a 583 and 538 those two hopefully will have a little bit more it looks like the accounting methods here in 538 oh, okay. should cover more of that not that we're doing that right now. This is, again, just going to be the workshop at this point. But, you know, for the future stuff. Uh, I'm going to throw a little note on this here real fast. Publication 538. And I'm going to link this just for myself for the future. For when I come back and I do this. Boom. Done. Awesome. All right. Back to the workshop here. Are we ready to move on to the next? Yep. Sweet. Form 99 to options. Okay. So what am I required to file with the IRS? Well, there are details on annual filing requirements on the required filings page of the life cycle at irs.gov. You'll probably need to file one of the Form 990 series returns, which is the annual information return required for most tax exempt organizations. Which one you'll file will depend on the type of your organization, the amount of your annual gross receipts, and the total of your organization's assets at the end of the tax year. www.irs. It's really funny that they say that because right now, since January 1st, 2020, you can only file the 990 easy. organizations have to file a 990 series return. Like, they're not taking paper applications at all. Organizations don't have an annual yeah, filing requirement. Because I show how old these slides are. Have yep. other filing requirements, such as employment tax records. It's important to note that there are serious consequences for not filing a required annual information return. Mm -hmm. If your organization doesn't file for three years in a row, its tax-exempt status will be automatically revoked on the due date Ooh. of the third return. If your tax-exempt status is revoked for not filing, and you want to get your status back, you'll have to redo the application process, including filing Form 1023 and paying <laughs> the appropriate user fees. Well, I mean, they give you three years. Yeah. Like, come on. Which means dated back to the day it was revoked. 
you'll have to show you had a reasonable cause for not filing. So my best advice is to file annually. Mm -hmm. Remember that in addition to submitting an annual return, you may need to submit filings for your unrelated I've already seen this one. income or UBI. Select the UBI Basics button to move forward. There, there's no button. <laughs> yeah, what button? There yeah, we go. There All right. <laughs> okay, so what's UBI? Generally, unrelated business income is any income from trade or business activity that your organization conducts on a regular basis that's not substantially related to your organization's exempt purpose. There are lots of activities that can generate UBI, such as commercial advertising and publications created by your organization, or selling goods or services to the public. Income from unrelated activities like these might be taxable. Calculating and reporting UBI is a requirement for maintaining your tax exempt status. Keep in mind that too much unrelated business can jeopardize your tax exemption. That sounds pretty easy. Not entirely. He's just given you a very simple explanation, but don't worry. There's a whole course dedicated to UBI here on Stay Exempt. The course teaches you which activities generate UBI. Once you understand UBI, Filing the form to report we the learned about that last time any tax due is relatively straightforward all right I'll remember to look into that is there anything else you might need to file other returns depending on your organization's activities you can find out about those on the IRS website as well but form 990 is the biggest and most important the next stage of the life cycle is ongoing compliance select the ongoing compliance button to continue yeah, we went over that last bullet point a yep. lot over the last one. Yep, uh, the whole uh, where it was basically broken down in like a third of your stuff can't come from uh, non-related stuff, a third of your uh, income can't come from investments, that kind of stuff, yeah. Exactly. All right, I understand that most organizations have an annual filing requirement. What's next? Do you know the particulars about what your organization must do? or must not do to safeguard its exempt status? No, the rules. I can't do too many activities that don't directly promote my organization's exempt purpose, which is to prevent animal cruelty. Well, that's certainly true, but there are other do's and don'ts associated with tax exempt status, which is what this next stage covers. For example, many activities can jeopardize your tax exempt status, such as political activity, lobbying, or permitting private benefit or enormment. We'll be covering those later in this course. Another challenge facing exempt organizations is accurately classifying and reporting on any paid workers they have. If your organization compensates anyone for services, either employees or independent contractors, there are rules you need to follow. The Employment Issues course here at Stay Exempt will help you sort all of that out. There are two more ongoing compliance issues you need to be aware of, and we'll go over those next. Select the Public Inspection button to continue. Okay. One second, I'm just writing some of this down. All right. The one that I really want to know more so about is the employment like issues. The, the rest of the stuff is very straightforward in its documentation. Must make their exempt application, determination letter, and the three most recently filed annual information returns available to the public upon request and without charge, except for a reasonable charge for copying. If your organization is a 501c3 and filed Form 990T, Exempt Organization Business Income Tax Return, your three most recent 990Ts must be made available as well. What about other records I'm keeping? You only have to disclose the forms themselves, any attachments or separate items you sent in with the forms, and any correspondence you may have had with the IRS about the forms. There is an exception though. If you had to file Schedule B of Form 990... Hello, hello, and welcome. Hello. This is Kevin okay. Jordan. Kevy joining us midstream here for, for section two of the IRS.
tax exempt status. We are in the middle of ongoing compliance for public inspection. Welcome, Kevin. Oh, okay. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. And I had um, some technical difficulties. No worries. Um, I think we might have a slight issue with the recording situation since we can't add you to that. But you know what? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I. I I, I can jump out. I can jump out. Like, no, 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 no. It's no. my it's my fault for not. You know. <laughs> uh, uh. All I was gonna say is we. I won't be able to make your voice sound all super sexy and nice, but uh, you're more than okay. welcome to stay and hang out. Absolutely. Plus, okay. we're we're only doing one section today, one small section, so we don't have that much more to go through. So, like, dude, just hang out, have fun. Okay. Okay. But anyways, yeah. Welcome, Kevy. <laughs> <laughs> So basically where we're at is, uh, do you remember last week when we were going over the section where it was like, what is the, uh, oh, what was it called? Um, like the public disclosure stuff? Mm, oh, yes, yes. So that's basically what we're in detail of right now is oh, what what dude. what are we going to need okay. to have, right? And so yeah. that is like what, what needs to be available for public inspection, mostly by the IRS uh, or if someone else requested it that has authority to do so like state level or something like that but it's uh all this stuff right up on the thing right now uh so we're just going over that and just writing down the notes for it okay uh three ms t's it's basically it's like you just need all the application stuff you need all any of the the last three years returns and stuff pretty straightforward what, are are they talking about that stuff being like public information as far as for like going to like maybe like a government website where they where someone can look at because it is it i guess so to say it's like you know for example if you're on the stock market and you're a publicly traded company you have to put your information for anyone to see right 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 okay so it, it, it's not necessarily where we have to have a um a public facing thing that they can pull from. It's more of like if they request it from us, we have to present it. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, usually that's going to be directly through uh, most of all of that stuff's done through mail. There's almost nothing oh. done over the phone or over email, especially when it comes to government stuff. It's almost always done through the mail. Um, and old school. All right. <laughs> it was not, ju it's not just necessarily old school. It's, uh, it, it, it's, uh, um, like legally binding um it's like imagine like if the irs called you and you had to chat over the phone which of course they will and you'll, you'll have that kind of situations and certain things but it's like they're not going to call us and and be like hey uh uh you know fucking send all this stuff over to us they're gonna mail it to us i see and then see. and then we have like a certain time frame to respond and stuff like that um but again okay. This is not just the IRS. This is also state and local municipalities, depending on where we have our thing. They, they can all do this. They can all request this. And most okay. of them won't. That's pretty cool, though. It's just that. that we need to know that, like, this is, like, this stuff that's, like, ongoing that we have to make sure that we always have. So, like, if someone does, we can respond to it right away. Okay. They really like the number three. Right. Oh. So I'm hopping on my computer. Oh. Dude, this is interesting. I thought this did. Schedule B doesn't need to be disclosed. That's yeah, the list that... of our donors and their like addresses and shit. Like like that doesn't mean that doesn't need to be saved. I surprised ah. me too. <laughs> I'm gonna look into some um some more details on that one. I have some questions about that because I feel like we would we would still save it for records and stuff like that um to like show where money came from and whatnot yeah i would think that you would want to i would think you'd have to but all right uh we cool moving on to the next slide yep I'm all right good on my end all right moving on to the next one is not required to be open for public inspection for your form 1023 for example you would also make your organizing document available for public inspection because you sent that document to the IRS when you submitted Form 1023. Oh, I so guess, just real quick, I guess this actually also would fall under the Freedom of Information Act, so individuals could pull this information if they wanted to. ...letter you receive back oh, from the IRS sense. at the end of the application process. That has to be made available. 
On the other cool. hand, the internal books and records you use to prepare your Form 990 aren't... Oh! Got it! Got it! Okay. You send them in as part of your Form 990 filing. You just use them to prepare it. Got it. Where should I keep... All right, so just to clarify real fast. So basically what we were just saying about having, like, the addresses and the names and the amounts of the donors of who's given us money, important for us to keep it on our end. And we use that information to file our annual return. Totally makes sense. That's the 990. We have to make the 990 available for anyone. We do not have to make the, the the information that goes that builds that form available. So that now I see why that doesn't okay. have to be disclosed because that that, that would be given all kinds of information out to whoever wanted. Yeah, that, cool. All right, that makes a lot of sense. Documents available at the organization's principal office during regular business hours. Well, what if we don't have regular business hours? <laughs> And man, if we just had it like thrown up on a web page, that'd be 24 hour access. Significant events button for more information. All right. So that's pretty straightforward for ongoing um, compliance. Ready for the significant events. Significant events. What kinds of significant events are there? The significant events all have to do with your tax-exempt status. The events include, but aren't limited to, audits, private letter rulings, and determination proceedings. More information on this stage can be found using this link. Before we test your knowledge, let's go over what we've covered so far. Select the recap button to continue. Just gonna copy that down real quick. Same. Significant events, I think, would also include things like any major changes. You know, like if you're doing, like, changing of, like, a board of directors position or something like that. Any, like, big major things like that. I feel like that might be more of a meeting minutes thing, though. But I'm, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe it's... Why not both? Por que no los dos? All right. Are we ready for the recap? Yep, yep. Recap. We talked about the tax exempt status life cycle. Tax exempt life cycle. Organizations maintaining their tax exempt status. This Required filings. Issues such as record keeping, annual returns, and unrelated business income. We also mentioned jeopardizing tax exempt status, which we'll talk about more later in this course, employment tax issues, public inspection requirements, and we talked about other significant events for tax exempt organizations. Now that you've learned about the stages of the life cycle, let's try an exercise. I like how there's nothing Select under the significant events. <laughs> let's test your knowledge. Which of the following are responsibilities that will keep Richard's organization from losing its tax-exempt status? Select the best answer. When you're done, select the submit button to check your answer. So we are looking for responsibilities that will keep the organization. I can't speak today, man. I bet it's from from losing the tax exempt status, let's go. Letter writing, open fund ra fundraising events, annual gala events, political organizing, lobbying, candidate forums. Oh, it's that one. That one for laundry, sure. Laundry, <laughs> house cleaning, power washing, record keeping, annual filings, public disclosures. <laughs> so we are looking for what will keep the organization from losing its tax exempt status, B will definitely make it lose it. <laughs> yeah, B is like the complete opposite of what you want to. Be. All right, so I, uh, D, yeah, we're well, gonna. C would be laundry, house cleaning, and power washing. That's like, what that's we do like with our money. No, I'm, just <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that's a lie. No, that's just a joke. I swear. <laughs> All right, but we we agree on D. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's Yay! We got it right. It's D. Record keeping, annual filings, public disclosure. Now let's check number two. Richard's organization, if he fails to file Form 990, Form 990EZ, or Form 990N for, for three, three years? years? Come on, select man. The best answer. When you're done, select the submit button to check your answer. <laughs> I just want <laughs> to read this off real years. quick. Ta like, this is the number one <laughs> answer to that question. Tax exempt, status revoked. And bread and water for three years. What the? What the <laughs> fuck did that come? Where no, the I, fuck I, I did that just come from? Well, <laughs> A and B are almost the same, except for bread and water for three years. Yeah. What? Why bread? And, oh, oh, who? Yeah. Who gives the bread and, bread and water? And water? <laughs> I want bread and water from the IRS. Come on, bread. 
So you lose your tax exempt status and they give you bread and water? I'm just. <laughs> All right. So tax exempt status revoked and a lifetime ban from Section 501 <laughs> or tax exempt status revoked and loss of eligibility to receive tax deductible donations. I'm thinking C or D. So what they said is that yeah, your tax away. exempt status is revoked um, yep. and that. You have to apply again, all over again. And you have to okay. pay for the user fee all over again. It's like a whole new application. Yep, gotta start all over. But what I'm curious... So I'm actually thinking it's D. That, because if you yeah. have your exempt yeah. status, yeah. then obviously you, you wouldn't be able to take donations and that, that are tech. <sighs> that are exempt. Yeah, because there's no there's no time frame thing. So yeah, I'm gonna have to agree with D. We all ready? Yep. Yep. That's right. Woo -woo. Yeah. Where go? Progress check. You've completed the responsibilities and life cycle section of this course. Woo! Next, you'll learn about more activities that can jeopardize the tax exempt status of your organization. Select the continue button to move forward. All right. So. Just looking real fast. Make sure we're following along here. Significant events. Perfect. All right. Moving on. We all ready to go? Yep. yep. Sweet. Jeopardizing so, your tax exempt I'm status. I'm supposed to do to keep my tax exempt status. What about the things I'm not supposed to do? Well, Richard, there are four major categories of activities that can jeopardize your tax exempt status. Lobbying, political campaign intervention, activities generating excessive unrelated business income, and private benefit, inurement. Some of these activities are absolutely prohibited, while others are restricted. Let's take a quick look at the first three, and an in-depth look at the fourth. Select the first three are straight up completely prohibited. The fourth one is really complicated. Eight <laughs> years. Yep. Actually, lobbying and political campaign intervention are two different things. Yep. Lobbying is any activity designed to influence legislation, while political campaign intervention is participating in a political campaign on behalf of or in opposition of a candidate for public office. Yep. Though they are both related to politics, the activities are different, as are the rules for exempt organizations participating in them. Lobbying is legislative, cam can political campaign innovation is specific to campaigns. Exemption. It just can't be a principal activity of the organization. The three L's help me remember the rule here. Lobbying is about legislation. And a 501c3 <laughs> Literally what I just said. <laughs> the rule for 501c3s and political activity is very different. A 501c3 can't conduct any political activity. I use the three P's to keep this rule straight. Political activity is about people running for office, and 501c3s are prohibited from getting involved, either for or against. Doing so Just to clarify, so like pretty much if there was like some national legislation or something like that, and we wanted to be like, hey, this is a cool thing, we could talk about it, make, not make it our main point. But if there was like an individual candidate, we couldn't do anything about that. You know, does that make sense? Can you like? Hmm. Oh, here, here. I'll extrapolate a little bit more. So, like, for instance, uh, recently in our country, America, there was a infrastructure bill being argued in Congress. We could limitedly speak in behalf of either pro or against, or even have discussions about it, right? In the name of our charity, like, but not as our main focus. However. If, like, people wanted to have a thing about it and, like, we wanted to say, like, hey, pub crawler supports this. You should, too. That has a line of, like, we can't really make it our only thing that we do, but we can have a little bit of it. But what we can't do is we can't say, like, for instance, let's say, like, Trump and Hillary uh, Clinton, when they were running for each other, we couldn't say the pub crawlers supports this candidate or this candidate. It can never be about a individuals campaign for any office like we can't say this person is better or we can't even say like the pub crawlers thinks that person's not good at that that's all individual stuff that's all personal stuff and the people involved can 
but as a a, a, a a charity foundation, like the pub crawlers in name can't be created for helping or being against that campaign. But if we talk about some legislation stuff going on, that's different. Does that, I think I'm making it more confusing. <laughs> no, I understand. I mean, it's the reason why they say it's a very fine line. You know, you can't support a candidate, but you can state that like if you're having an event, you could say, "Oh, this is." Uh, no, you probably can't. No, go ahead and say what you're saying. No, so, like, like an event for a candidate. No, you can't do that. No, absolutely yeah, not. No, it, it's it's supporting that specific yeah. candidate. Yeah, yeah, it just like you can't. Yeah, no involvement with campaigns. Period. Like, n not at all. Yeah, it's like that. That that's a hard nope. Yep. Yep. And then the 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 lobbying thing, where it's like about specific like legislation. You know, that's. That's a different line, but uh, again, it can't be the main focus. Does that make enough sense for us to move on? Yeah. Cool. Yep, yep. So jeopardizes their exemption. You'll find lots more about prohibited political intervention in a course called Political Campaigns and Charities, the ban on political campaign intervention. That's one of the last the sections. The at stay exempt. Let's talk a it's little like section more five or six or something like that. Come next. Select the un Unrelated business income. Like I said before, unrelated business income is any income you generate from business activities that occur on a regular basis and are not substantially related to the exempt purpose of your organization. The tests and criteria for determining if a fundraising activity this slide seems UBI out of place are covered in the UBI course here at Stay Exempt. And let me add two things about UBI. First. Funds generated through unrelated business activities can be subject to taxes. But what's more important is that if too many of your activities are not related to your exempt purpose, you're jeopardizing your exempt status. Makes Remember, sense. Remember, your organization received tax-exempt status because you told the IRS it would pursue an exempt purpose. Mm -hmm. If it's not doing that, the reason for tax-exempt status isn't there either. Makes sense. Next, yep. let's talk about private benefit and enormous. There's really not much to say on that. They actually did cover all of that earlier when they said any income that occurs on a regular basis that is not substantially related to the exempt purpose of the organization would be UBI. And yep. last week when we talked about it, um, I, th I think I'm repeating myself here, but like, yeah, there's like a minimum uh, percentage that can't be more than a third, basically. Yep. And uh, for us specifically pertaining to what we'll be doing, I really don't think there's going to be almost any UBI. Because anything that would be donation-based, uh, the way that we structure it in our articles of, of uh, association, the best way in my mind, we're going to have to talk about this as a group, though, is you basically just have an algorithm already set of, like, money comes in, X amount of this money goes this way, X amount goes that way. You know, like, you have your percentages broken down so that none of that discussion, uh, it has to be done every day. But um, Right, right. It's, like, done all automatically. Like exactly. We already... In, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where this, this amount goes. Right. And so, like, for us to have UBI, that would mean that we're doing something that's generating income outside of that. Um, for instance, I could... Like, one example that I could come up with just to, like, kind of make sure we all understand this is... Let's say someone is streaming under the pub crawlers, right? Would we... All right. Need, would we... Uh, uh, personally, I think that if anyone's doing something like that... Any donations that they make would be theirs individually. But let's say that the uh, we didn't. Let's say that like pub crawlers required some percentage, right, or something. Mm -hmm. um, that technically is kind of on that fine line. Like, is that that person representing us, or is that someone else doing their own thing that's unrelated to us? You know. So like, if they were streaming under the pub crawler's name, that would be related. But if they were streaming under their own name and then like giving us a percentage for some reason then I would see that as well, UBI, right? That, I mean, that would be considered a donation. There, you, a, there you go, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like, yeah, it really comes down to where and why and how, they're yeah. They're representing themselves. Yep, yep. All right. We ready to move on? Yep, yep. Good to go. Private so benefit private and inurement. Private benefit and inurement are two separate but closely related concepts. Let's look at private benefit first. Private benefit is any activity that substantially benefits the private interest of an individual or organization, right? Exactly, Vernon. 
A 501c3 must avoid all activities that provide primarily private benefit. The 501c3's activities must serve a public interest. What if I have employees? Isn't the salary some kind of private interest? No, this doesn't mean a 501c3 can't pay reasonable salaries to its employees or provide services to its constituents. Rather, it means the organization can't be operated or its income or assets used in such a way that someone receives a substantial private benefit well beyond what would be considered reasonable compensation for work. Makes sense. Let's talk about enormous next. Except so for how the enormous fuck enormous does the Susan G. Komen exist then? <laughs> question like one percent of their donations goes to what their their cause is for hmm. <laughs> sorry so that, I, I digress the concept of endowment <laughs> takes the notion of private benefit a bit further you can't conduct activities that will provide anyone with a substantial private benefit when it comes to insiders of the organization absolutely none of the income or assets can accrue to their benefit Oh, in case you haven't heard that term before. Richard, I got you. That makes totally easy. Yeah. All right. So basically what they're saying is like, let's say we have like a thousand dollars just sitting in a slush fund of some kind. Right. And we decide right. let's go invest that money. Right. And we throw it in some like uh, EFT or some some kind of account that like over the year it makes, let's say, 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent, whatever amount. You can't have that increase in money go to, say, just the director's. You know what I mean? Like it, it has to go back to the like the entity itself. It has to go back to the pub crawlers, not to like, like oh, I, yeah. like like if I if we put pub crawler money in as an investment, I personally couldn't take out the in the the accrued interest or something. That's what inurement is saying. Make sense? Yeah, I like that explanation. Yeah, yeah, it sounds good. I mean, the money can't go to any of the people in the organization directly. It has to go through the entity itself, which. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such a fine line there. But well, I totally it, get why they do that, you know. And and here's like, a funny like like re response to that is you could just have it set up where uh, this is this is something that I'm I'm not sure, but if you wanted to do that, wouldn't it be able to do it where that money goes back into the business, but then that person's paid off like a percentage based off of how well the thing does? Isn't that the same thing? Yes but different because it's changing where the flow of the money is going through. It can't be like that entity made money and it pays me directly. Mm. Got it. Yeah. Uh, allow income or assets to accrue the benefit. Of I mean, they did say you can, you, it's, you can even pay people in your organization a salary for, for public interest. But, I mean, but it yeah. can't be like some astronomical fee that like would not make sense in any other like company or something. You know, it, it can't be just for the benefit of one person. Like, let's right. say like we make this and ninety nine percent of the donations go to one person. Can't do that. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that makes sense. But I'm gonna. Then you swear to invest it into the public, right? No, I'm just kidding. Well, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, I no, I mean, I'm sure there's like some all kinds of fancy ways to go around it and where the money hits first and how it's spent and who spends it and what name and for what reason. I'm sure there's all kinds of crazy ways to work it, but that's not what we're interested in. <laughs> nope, nope. <laughs> oh, I, I, that, that was sarcasm. I was just. You know, I got you for, for the benefit of insiders. All right, I'm going to keep playing. Or private interest in the activities of the organization. I'm still not sure who would qualify as an insider. Examples of typical what? insiders are officers, forward. Come on. directors, and key employees like you. Can you give me some examples of inurement? Sure. Some examples include paying dividends or unreasonable compensation to insiders. Yep. As well as exactly what we just said. Property to insiders mm -hmm. for less mm -hmm. than fair that's value. another good. Uh, good oh. Yeah, that's a. Oh, wow. The repercussions Fuck yeah. I'm sh oh. yeah. That's a good one. That's a good note. <laughs> Because <laughs> yeah. it's not it's not just monetary. It's any any technical property. So that's asset. Yep. Asset and, yep. And yep. All that. Are there any cases where enormment is allowed? No. Any amount of enormment is grounds for loss of tax exempt status, 
and the insider Ooh. involved may be subject to excise tax. Totally makes sense. But if the activity is not played around, no. benefits someone who is not an insider, that benefit must be substantial in order to jeopardize the organization's tax exempt status. Interesting. But as I said earlier, prohibited enormment or private benefit doesn't include reasonable payments for services, other payments that further tax exempt purposes, or payments for the fair market value of real or personal property. Select the charitable solicitation button to move forward. So this is all basically just very, very, very easily like conceived things if you were going to be doing a charitable situation. It's basically to keep people from scamming people for money, which is right. you know. I'm eager to start collecting funds, but I'm worried. I may be breaking some rules in that area. What oh, I Richard. First? first of all, Understandable. each state has laws regulating I would fundraising, same way. <laughs> as well as how you go about soliciting donations. These include requiring that you register your organization, special rules when fundraising activities involve paid solicitors and fundraising counsel, and specific procedures for filing financial documents. Each state is different, so be sure to check with each state you'll be fundraising in to confirm their requirements. When you're ready, we should talk about governance. Select the governance button to learn more. So, not necessarily what state that you were founded in, yeah. but with whatever state that you're getting the donations from. No, 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 no. Um, we might no. We might want to go that over again because it's not necessarily where the funds are coming from. It's where you are. like. For instance, if we get someone that donates money from uh, New York, they they live in New York, but we're formed in Wyoming. We file our stuff in Wyoming, right? But when they go on their taxes and they like write off their taxes, that would be in uh, New York, for instance. But we, oh God, yeah. So uh, uh, our anything that we bring in is subjected to wherever we file our stuff. Um, I think I added a from in there after soliciting funds. And ah, confused myself. Ah, I got you. Um, I actually, I, I, I hate to do this, um, but. Do you guys mind taking like just a 30 second break real quick? I'm going to use a restroom real fast. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah, have at it. Yeah, what what I'm getting out of this though, Kiss by is Bro, no, I am not reading chat. Hold up. <laughs> no, I am not reading chat. <laughs> <laughs> We're uh, you're that's that, no, no, chat, whole nother thing. <laughs> Shit, I think I pissed someone off. But yeah, um I'll be right back in like 30 seconds real fast. Um okay. just say. Already. So what like, you saying, what, Kevin? Oh, just what what I'm getting out of this. It's like wherever that your business is, um, that the the funds that you get, it doesn't necessarily matter where they they come from if they're in a different state. But when you go to file those things to the, whatever that whatever Wyoming, for example, if you're in Wyoming, if they require they require certain tax information. Then you have to provide that to them. That's what I'm getting out of it. Doesn't yeah, matter yeah, exactly where the money's coming from. Just where you're set up at, as the organization. So, Pope Collins was in, like, well, I guess we'll just keep going with Wyoming. Mm -hmm. That's that's where we we'd only be worried about Wyoming, as opposed to say, say uh, Kevy donates. 50 bucks from New York. Mm -hmm. We don't have to worry about New York. So, well, you or, what, or whatever they require, like exactly. information wise, like, yeah, that, that that's what I'm getting out of it. But I think Bash understands, but he's used to back. No, I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> Bash is back. Bash is back. That was like less than 30 seconds, by the Bro, way. Bro, I tried to piss past the fucking because I was like, horse. Oh <laughs> <laughs> we were fighting it. <laughs> you uh, shake it too much, you're playing with it, just so you know. I mean, I was shaking it while I was pissing. Does that mean, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> That's just efficiency. Trying to go quick like, hey. I just want to, like, have a bath and that just is, like, half of it's just, like, a big toilet. So I could just do that. What? That sounds disgusting. Yeah. Well, you can, oh. <laughs> Never mind. No. That's called just pissing in the shower, Kevin. Yeah. No, true, no. True, true. No, you definitely want to say it where you're like, I just want a giant shower that's, like, too big for, like, a shower door. And it's just, like, tiled everywhere and has, like, one of those big ring shower heads. And then you can just, like, shake your piss all around. 
<laughs> just you know, going with just, a hose yeah, afterwards. Just reimagine my down. imagination. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's finish this. Let's let's finish this fun up here. Uh, we're done with charitable solicitation on uh, where and when, but we ready to go on to governance. Yes. All right. Yeah. Cool. Tips for governance. So, what are your governance tips for my organization? Well, we found that an organization is more likely to operate effectively and consistently with tax law requirements if it can clearly articulate its purpose selects a knowledgeable and committed governing body and management team, and adopts sound management practices. The IRS requests information about an organization's governance on the application for tax exemption, and again annually on the information return most organizations file. Before we do an exercise, let's go over what we've covered in this section. Select the recap button to continue. I'm just gonna write this down. Select a knowledgeable, ah, thank you, Google, and committed governing body. And adopt sound management practices. practices. Thank you again, Google. All right. Ready to right. go over the recap? Yep, yep. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> wait, wait, I can pause it. Do you have a question, though? Uh, uh, no, no, it's, it's okay. What's your question? What's your question? I, I, was trying to, I was just trying to write down stuff, but I, I'm i slow with writing. Oh, my go bad. Ahead. Okay, so uh, no, 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 it's okay. Uh, I have it up on the left side. I, ty I typed it the same ones, if you want. Under tips for governance, it looks a little ugly right now. But clearly articulate organization's purpose. Select knowledgeable and committed governing body and management team. And then adopt Wait, sound management practice. This is under tips for governance. Mm, okay, okay. It's basically like what the IRS is going to be looking at when they look over our uh, application. Okay. Like, how do we make these decisions? Do we already have it organized? Or are we just kind of winging it? Gotcha, gotcha. I could definitely summarize what you're saying into that where I can put in a note that I'll understand. Cool. Do you want me to hold for another moment? Or are you good to move forward? Nope. You, you go ahead. Got Avoid it. Avoid jeopardizing your tax-exempt status. First, we talked about political campaign intervention and lobbying. There's a separate course on political campaign intervention, but you should have a basic understanding of what those things are. Then we talked about unrelated business income and how that might jeopardize your tax-exempt status. We covered private benefit and enormous. Your organization shouldn't engage in activities that substantially benefit the private interest of any individual or organization, nor allow any income or assets to accrue for the benefit of insiders. Which totally makes sense. how to find sense. out more about charitable solicitation rules for your state and implementing good government practices. Next, let's try an exercise to see if you're ready to move on. Select the activity. All let's right. Let's test your knowledge. Read Richard's scenario, then choose the best answer. Select the submit button to check your answer. Richard is the president of his organization, Cute and Curly Animal Rescue. By his, his bylaws require that he have a seven-member board of directors, and he is a voting member. Richard is also Richard is also owns. Come on, IRS. Richard is also owns 49% of the for-profit Precious Pets pet store, and his sister, Deborah, runs the pet store and owns 51% of the business. It's actually really interesting that it's 49%. This is going to be fun. Okay, so Cute and Curly contracted with the Precious Pets for $200,000 worth of animal food and supplies for Cute and Curly Animal Rescue. Richard signed the contract without his consulting, without consulting his board of directions for action. That's, that's a no-no. Deborah knows there will be no competitive bid for the contract, so she decided to bill for 120% of fair market value for the products. She calls the contract the Precious Pets Deluxe Package, but in reality, they are the same products she provides to any customer. 
Does this scenario show private benefit or inurement? I'm going to say no. Because, I mean, Richard signed the contract. I mean, so and, I mean, they're they're They bought food that is for the public, like through her store, through the store for people to go to. And whatever she marks it up as. I mean, that's the I feel like that's like the contractor's disclosure, like with themselves that they can mark it up however they want. What do you think? Kiss? Um, Oh, wait, go, go ahead and finish. Yeah. Go ahead and finish. I'm just going to say, I'm going to say no. Okay. Uh, what do you think, Kiss? Oh, that's a tough one because, I mean, Richard also owns a, a good chunk of the precious pets, so he's kind of just shuffling money around. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So let's look at the real important things here. We're talking IRS here. So all the, like, emotional shit don't matter. Only thing that matters is the numbers. He owns 49% of this company, and it is interacting with his board of, uh, I mean, it's interacting with his nonprofit. So being a business owner that owns something of that substantial amount, but he's not the, he doesn't own 50% or more, yeah. technically means that that doesn't matter. However, there's two other pieces. He did not vote on it. With his board of directors and in his bylaws, it requires that they vote on it. And two, it was for 120% over the fair market value. So technically, I think, personally, I think because he didn't vote on it and because it's over fair market value and because he has a substantial involvement, I think it actually does show private benefit. But oh, you know what? They did point out about the fair market value yes as a piece as well so however however i don't know if 20 percent is enough over fair market value to be considered a like gross exaggeration yeah so it's like that's not that bad because it like 20%. tech just, yeah could be overhead. technically <laughs> you could just write that off as like hey uh, you know employment costs were up this month or some shit you know you like man this this is right on that line, but I do believe the one and only thing that matters in this, all of these numbers, he signed it, he owns 49%, and he didn't get his seven-member board to vote on it. Mm -hmm. And it's in his bylaws. Oh, mm. He says his bylaws require that he have a seven-member board of directors and he is a voting member. Oh, shit. But, well, I, but I don't see it as a, a private benefit or inurement. I don't, I don't see, like, okay, even if he didn't get the vote by everyone who is part of the board, mm -hmm. I just don't see how him signing that and moving forward with it is privately benefiting him. Because he or, owns the business that is oh, being paid. Oh, shit. So there was, oh. But, but he owns a good chunk of it. So, so, yeah, so, well, so I think. Just about well, half. I think if he owned 51%, it would be a yes. But I think because yeah. he owns 49%, it's a no. However, that vote thing. But in his bylaws, it doesn't say anything that it requires a vote. It just requires to have seven oh. members on the board. Yeah. Oh, so I'm still going to say no. I'm going to go. I'm going to lean. I'm going to say no. All right. We're going to we're going to go with no, because I, I, th I think these numbers are all trying to show us one side. However, this right here, that 120 and the no vote might be the reason why it's a yes. I'm going to click no with a heavy caveat that I think it's going to be yes still. Yep. Oh, you are. Oh. So, so Richard is an insider. Hold on. It's good. Yeah, it's going to explain it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Richard is an insider. He owns part of Precious Pets, and he has a personal financial interest in the contract. He is making money off of his, his things, making that, uh, by signing that, he's making personal money. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. He used his position within the uh, animal rescue to steer the contract towards his own interest, which is Precious Pets. Yeah. Yeah. And he signs a contract without competitive bidding or anything or any kind of uh, search. And he didn't get the uh, uh, involvement of his board. But that doesn't really matter. It's not even listed on here. Then it, it says... It, it kind of does, though. It doesn't. No, it doesn't say that. It just says that he himself didn't competitively uh, 
uh, bid or search. But it actually doesn't say anything because that wasn't in his bylaws. Interesting. I'll I'll get it. I'll I'll explain after like how I look at it. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, and I feel a little disappointed in myself. I feel like I should know this. Uh, when, for example, okay, bidding on pool construction work. Mm-hmm. If you're going through a commercial building or a residential, like, uh, shit, what are they called? Uh, like apartment building or mm-hmm. something like commercial, that. Commercial, yeah. Um, they're required to get three bids. Yep, minimum. Show yep. that they are getting they're they're not just like benefiting one specific thing yep anytime you do Um, uh municipal money stuff you have to get a minimum of bids too yeah i feel like what they're saying is you know he did he didn't show that he was you know getting more bids and getting in like putting that that legwork in yes and i agree with you what Um, i'm saying though is they're they're not there's no requirement for him to bring it to his board he can make the decision on his own but he didn't competitively mm -hmm. uh compare it to anything he just found one did it yeah it, but it does say that bidding or search for alternative providers is probably enough to show endearment which okay probably is enough of a yes but i definitely can see where he, when he signed a contract it was for his own benefit yeah like if he would have yeah. like and that's and that's private interest if he would have so. just put like one bid out there to one other company even one other company and then ha- and shown that it was a better choice to choose this one. Yep. Yep. That would have been enough to like show probable cause. But if he would have found a few of them, then there's no question. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And then Deborah's decision to overcharge for the supplies creates a situation where they're clearly impermissible in your mint to Richard. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. That, so I, that, that one 20%, that yep. 20% goes to, you know, goes to him or yep. goes to both of them really. Yep. But yeah, him, him as well. So one of the other things, um, I'm mad at myself not getting that. Okay. One of the things that, that it's is not, it, they are talking about it in this right here, but is extremely, extremely strict is in our board of directors, right? We can't have this situation even arise by the way that you're supposed to be structured. Richard should not be owning a company that's interacting with his uh, uh, nonprofit <laughs> where he owns that substantial amount and isn't doing like, like there's actual laws in the IRS code that prohibit that situation from happening even outside of a Nerman. So like this is wrong in multiple ways. Um, but yeah. Nice job. You learned about jeopardizing the tax exempt status of an organization. Select the continue button to move forward. I think there's you know, there's a I lo- specific I love how he term. Just said, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I, I from what I was just saying, there's a specific term that I want to I can't recall, but it's like special interest individuals where it's like people that own controlling shares in companies and how you interact with them with your uh nonprofit, they can't work for your nonprofit too is what I was trying to get to. But anyways, what were you saying? Oh, I was just going to say I love how, you know, even though two or three of us got it wrong, I still learned what inurement and private interest can be considered. Yeah. And I'm happy about that. It is a lesson to be learned. Nice. <laughs> All right. Re- we ready to continue? Oh, yes. Good. Yes. Good to go. I've shared a lot of exempt organizations resources with you. I've put them together here, so feel free to review them. I mean. Oh, thank you. Um, but oh, yep, I all you right. Had, I was gonna say, I think you have all. I have all, all of them ones. open, but I'm just gonna put them in the order that he just did them. Cause I, 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 I go back over this after we're done. On behalf of everyone in Conclusion! the exempt organizations division, thank you for taking this course. Before you leave, please take a minute to send us your feedback. The information you I should actually start sending them feedback on the things that they got wrong. <laughs> you should. <laughs> be like, um, hi, we're going to be uh, applying in a few months, and here's everything you did wrong. Hey, I'm sure that they would appreciate it. I don't know. Any feedback is better than nothing. I don't know. Correct. Like, I kind of feel like if we send that, someone's going to be like, these pedantic little bitches. I'm going to fucking... <laughs> we're gonna make them fill out every single thing. Oh, oh, denied. <laughs> but then that's their private interest that they. Oh, and then we get. Oh. <laughs> but the IRS is in a fucking five hundred one. 
we will make the IRS sue the IRS. Oh, it's sideways again. Oh my god, they're all broken. All right, all right. So, um, I actually found this out uh when I was working on this the other day. There, it it does save correctly, but not right in here, not like this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for it, real. It, yes. It show, yeah. Yeah, it does, and it, and it's weird. You have to like put a, a space before and after for it to do it right. But yeah, um, okay, so twelve oh, February. Center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, uh, for that question that we got wrong, I did get a screenshot of the the red box in case. Perfect. Smart. You guys want that? Honestly, if you want to yeah, send I me that image, uh, I think that's a good record keeping yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, that's send send me that camera. image, and I'll put that in the tips for governance part right here on the note. Mm -mm -mm. Don't look at my stuff. Don't look at my desktop. No, get out of here, everybody. Stop. I, I can't see your desktop. Stop. All I see is the. Stop. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm like doxing my shit right now. No, stop, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> it's a unicorn thing. Leave me alone. I didn't catch it, so. <laughs> All right, so certificate of completion. This certifies that the pub crawlers completed the following course at stayexempt.irs.gov, maintaining 501c3's tax-exempt status. We have done Beautiful. it! We have done it! And it only took an hour and 21 minutes. Woo -woo. Very nice. Uh, you want to know the worst part, though? What's that? Um, Let's see. Let's see. Uh, da -da -da -da. It was supposed to only take 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, uh, we're learning here. It's all right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, let's, let's see. Is there anything else? I th so that's that's section two. Uh, we have like seven or eight more sections to go. Um, next week, we'll be doing a couple of them together. I think that's just it for today. Um, but... Yeah. Thank you for joining us, everyone. This was a lovely day of learning about the responsibilities, jeopardizing activities, charitable solicitations, and good governance practices for a 501c3 charitable foundation. Any other questions or things before we head off for the day? No, I'm, I'm good to go. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, that was great. Learned a lot. Kevin? I, I mean, I I only got in on half of it, but yeah. I feel like learning from the stuff from last week we did, uh, some of that kind of like spilled over into this where I can yes. kind of still be a little bit a part of it. So just apologize for being late. Ugh. Yeah, how dare you? Oh, Every, everyone's going to hold that against you. I'm going to try. I'm just going to mute you I, in the recording. and oh. just, just, <laughs> If you did, I would not be upset. If you did, I'd be like, I completely understand. We'd be like talking to people and it'd just be quiet on the other. Like, no, that would just, <laughs> No, all right. That well, would be pretty funny. Thank you, Kiss Bye. Thank you, Kevin Mack, for joining. And thank you, anybody that's, that watches this or checks it out later. We will see you again for section three next week. Cheers. Thank see you guys. Thank you. See you. Have a good one.